In the tapestry of time, a story unfolds of a faithful God whose love is forever endless. Through the lowest valleys and the highest mountains, his steadfast presence is always with us. In every trial and every test we face, he holds us close in his unchanging love. When shadows of doubt gather around us, his faithfulness shines as a brilliant sunrise. With arms stretched out, he guides our way, a beacon of hope in the darkest day. In every moment, his promises hold true. He paints the sky with hues of dawn, reminding us that we're never alone. Through every season, in joy or strife, God's faithfulness is the anchor of life. So let us trust in his unwavering hand as we journey through this shifting land. For in his love, we find our peace. He is always and forever faithful. Yeah, good morning. I wanted to start before before we actually start into some worship. I just wanted to share this with you. It's kind of laid on my heart this morning. And it's Psalm 103, which says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, and who redeems your life from the pit, and who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, and, satis and who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the, um, like the eagles. And so, Lord, I just wanted to, I wanted to kind of encourage that. That's kind of the, a little bit of the theme of this morning. Let's stand up. And let's worship together and proclaim that truth. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness new every morn. Our sins they are many. His mercy is more. What love could remember the wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into the sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many.
your trouble and heavy hearted come to Jesus and find your peace and if you're run down and empty handed just come to Jesus and find your Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the morning. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you. Lord, we uh, proclaim that you are hope, you are help, um, you restore us. Lord, we lean into you this morning, and I hope and I pray and we hope and we pray um, that our sense of self will be rooted in who you are and that you would fill us up this morning, Lord, and that only comes when we worship you for who you are. And as we look more closely this morning, Lord, to, um, to who you are, I just pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts, help us to see what you would have us see, and Lord, help us to apply your word to our lives each and every day. We just praise you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, please be seated for just a second, and as you're seated, let me welcome each and every one of you. If you've been here for a bunch of years, or if you're here first time today, I want to say welcome. And um, if you are new with us, uh, we, we'd love to get a little bit of your information. You can. There's a welcome desk out in the foyer. I would encourage you to go find whoever's standing behind that after the service is over. They got a little gift for you. Uh, you could also put um, the welcome card, which is on the seats in front of you. Uh, you could put it in that little silver box by the door there. And if you've been here for just a little bit, and you want to get better connected uh, to this church, we invite you to just check out our life groups. Uh, and maybe you've been here for a long time, but what you've done is you've come to events, you've come to 
maybe Bible studies, you've come to worship services, but you've not ever really looked into being part of a life group. Well, we encourage you to do that. You can find out more information about them on our website. You can also contact me. I can help you get directed to the right group for you. And I know a couple of you emailed me this past week. Um, and so I'm thankful for that. And you'll be hearing from me in the next day or two on that. But we just want to help everybody get connected because life groups is where you really get to know people in the body of Christ. There's a lot of value there. Um, if you've been here for, for any sort of time, any amount of time, and you can you feel like this is your church home, we also want to remind you just, hey, we need to give back to the Lord what he's given to us financially. Uh, and there's multiple ways to do that. You see those there on your screen. Um, and a couple quick announcements is, number one, uh, this coming Saturday, November the 11th, is our women's retreat. Uh, one day retreat, there are flyers on the table out in the foyer. You see information here on the screen, also on our website. And next Sunday, so that's next Saturday, next Sunday, a week from today, if you do the math, we're doing, well, we're having baptism here. And so if you've been thinking about being baptized and you're not quite sure what to do with that, I mean, just find me after the service is over. I'll be out there or email us. Or you can also go online. And you will find, you know, a way to click on that. But we would love to meet with you because, um, yeah, if you want to be baptized, if you're even thinking about it, next Sunday is a good time to do it. So all that being said, what I, what I want to do right now is I want to dismiss our kindergarten, no, actually our first graders through our fourth graders. Uh, you're dismissed to your ministries. And also, if you were in fifth or sixth grade, uh, every so often we gather together just as a group of fifth and sixth graders. And we're going to be right in the student room this morning as we continue to worship together with just y'all. So... I guess that means everybody first through sixth grade, y'all are dismissed as everybody else continues to worship in here.
Father God, we do. We thank you for this morning. And you are, you are a good God and you are a great God, sovereign over all things. And you love us in a way that we don't even understand. So Father God, we, we lift this morning up to you. God, I pray for, for every heart in this room, Lord, um, and every heart that is, is participating online. And uh, Lord, that you would, you would do that which only you can do. And that is to change hearts. That you would help us to understand who you are and who we are in light of you. Um, and respond rightly to that. You are a great God, and so we praise you and we thank you. We ask all of it in the name of Jesus. Amen. You guys can be seated. team. I just had to ask Doug. He just threw a, uh, an off-speed pitch there. We, we switched up the order. No, no, it's, it's perfect, actually. Um, I was going to, is a way to put in the Rangers, like the Rangers last pitch, right? We're all celebrating still. Uh, I almost wore my, I don't have any new swag, but I do have a 2011 heartbreak shirt from when we were in the World Series back then. So um, that, that was a really, really fun thing this week, wasn't it? Um, so one, one thing I want to make uh, note of, uh, thanking the worship team, thanking you. It just does so much for my soul to hear you uh, and to sing alongside of you. And I um, want to encourage you, invite you in not this Wednesday coming up the 8th, but the following Wednesday. We're going to have a worship night in here. We had one in June. And uh, looking forward to that, uh, Doug Dishman, who is leading us uh, this morning, will be one of the folks leading us in worship um, alongside our, our band. Uh, also, Michael and Allie Clements, who have come, uh, they're going to come. Uh, I think I'm jumping in the fun at some point as well. But we're doing um, a worship night and a hot chocolate bar. There may be some dessert going with that. Not sure, but um, afterwards, it's going to be 6.30, um, and it, it, won't, it won't even be an hour, most likely. And then the, the hot chocolate bar will be uh, ready for you uh, to enjoy just fellowship lingering and hanging out. Um, but that I, I highlight that because the series we're about to go through is actually our November practice in the witness and way, practicing the witness and way of Jesus. Our November practice is study. And study sounds like wah, 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 wah. Uh, and really second second Timothy 2:15 that the man of God should be uh, should demonstrate that he can handle accurately or literally it's cut straight the word of God but we only study the word so that we can know the God of the word and then we get to know the God of the word who is worthy of our worship and worship all it is is to declare his worth as we just sang he is he is and we mentioned all these things about him and that's exactly what this study is going to be we could study lots of things in the scriptures but we're going to look at um, one of the most foundational, essential passages we could study as our base camp. And then we're going to go on a journey in exploring who is our God? What is God really, really like? So we're going to do this each week. Um, our base camp verses in uh, Exodus 34, 6 and 7. It's going to put it on the screen here. Um, I'm not going to make you stand but we are going to say this together. Uh, and each week, what I want to encourage you over these next, uh, it's really six weeks, although one message in there will be um, our next practice. We'll kind of insert it in the middle. But I just want to encourage you to memorize this. This is the NASB updated version, not saying it's the best version or whatever, but I'm just encouraging you, let's all memorize the same version. Um, they're all good, um, and they give you good textures. Your version will give a good texture. They may not, may not say compassion, might say mercy, whatever. But I want us to memorize it together. I want to encourage you as a family, maybe put it on your mirror in your bathroom, maybe put it on your car dash, 
where you're still looking at the road, whatever, um, so that God's word can get into us. And particularly this passage, because it's God's word about himself. It's his self-disclosure of who he really is. So not having you stand, but let's say this out loud. And each week we'll do this. Avinash is preaching next week. Either he or someone else will lead, lead us through that. Let's say this together, Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Let's pray. Our God, we desire to know you as you really are. And if we're honest, we know that we can often fashion you in the way we'd like you to be. We get frustrated when you don't behave in the way we'd like you to behave, to push our agenda, to affirm our lifestyle preferences, to endorse our grudge holding, whatever it might be, Lord. But I thank you, Lord, that, that um, you don't behave in that way. You are not um, who we say you are. You are who you are, and then thankfully, you have told us and you have shown us in your word, in creation, in your son Jesus. And Lord, you call us to be little hints of who you are, and so I pray you might transform us as we behold you today so we might become more like you so that the hints of you as we leave this place might more truthfully display who you are. All of who you have said you are here, Lord, help us to understand and know you and make that the throb of our hearts, the lean of our lives, because in that we will find life and life to the full. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, who is God? And what is God like? What is he really like? I prayed about it a little bit, but we've got to, we've got to acknowledge that we often reduce God to manageable terms. We often say, well, this is the God I believe in, and the God I believe in is only this way. We tend to shrink him down to a little g God that we can control. We reduce him to where he can be managed. And though, so when we shrink him and we reduce him, we also, if we're honest, we can ignore him. We can conveniently ignore him when, so that we can go after life on our own terms, after our own preferences. And then, ironically, even those who say they don't believe in him will turn around, and we will too, and blame him when he doesn't quite get on board with our agenda. So what is God really like? And why does that matter? Why does it matter what you and I think when we think of God. What, why does it matter how we conceive of him? Why does it matter how we perceive him, understand him? Why does knowing him and who he really is matter? Well, A.W. Tozer wrote a book a long time ago called The Knowledge of the Holy. And here's a quote from him. He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Really? The most important thing. The thoughts you're having of God, as I'm even introducing, what's God really like? And for that split second before your mind goes elsewhere, and you're thinking about that, who do you think of when you think of God? What do you think of? He's, Tozer's saying, that's the most important thing about you. Wow, really? Because how little do we think of God? And if it's the most important thing about us, and we think so little of him, I don't mean like the reduction part, I mean volume of thoughts. 
I mean, frequency of consideration. If we think of him not so often, but it's the most important thing about us, what's the implication of that? The next part of his intro to his knowledge of the holy, he says, we tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. This is why it's so important. Were we able to extract from any man a complete answer to this question? So we're trying to ask this question. What comes to mind when you think about God? We're trying to extract out of them what they think. He says, we might predict with certainty the spiritual future of that man. So what we think about when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Why? Because what we think about him, we will gravitate, we will camp in, we will base our lives on or base our lives away from how we conceive of him and it ends up shaping us we become like the god that we think of or as we've said earlier and we'll say again in just a second what we behold the god we behold is what we will become or we will become like the one we behold jesus himself told us that So that's why it's so important. John Mark Comer, who I'm going to read a little bit from later, um, after uh, myself and Avinash uh, really workshopped this series, we got so excited about it, um, about, man, we want to to introduce folks to this passage in Exodus because this is where God for the first time says, here's who I am. He's been showing off, but now he's saying, here's who I am. And I was like, and we could trace that like, because it shows up again and again and again. We are all excited about it, and we did all this planning, and hey, we're going to do this and this. We're going we're gonna to help, help folks see the God, give them a profile of the God who goes with his people. And then I found out like three weeks ago that John Mark Comer wrote a book on it. And I'm like, dead gum. It's like very much like what we came up with, except for he camps more in Exodus 34. We're going to jaunt, and we'll come back to base camp occasionally, Okay. But here's what John Mark Comer says. He says, here's a truth that cuts across the whole of the universe. From believer to curious seeker to agnostic to atheist, this cuts across the whole universe. We become like what we worship. What you think about God will shape your destiny in life. Who God is has profound implications for who we are. Mike prayed that. He said, may our understanding of you... May it help us in our understanding of ourselves. We, we only understand, can only under, understand ourselves rightly once we are understanding God more clearly and who we are to him, this God who's revealed himself. And then he said, here's the problem. We usually end up with a God who looks an awful lot like us. Isn't that true? Um, Scott McKnight, who uh, is a professor and theologian, he uh, used to have a, a survey he would give to his theology students in his class. And, it, you know, it's kind of that first day of class. Hey, I want to get to know you. Teachers are smart to get this in writing, so then you can go back to it and go, hey, well, I, you know, hey, Johnny and Susie, I know a little bit about you. So it's kind of, tell me, tell me, you know, what makes you you? Like, what do you like? What are, what are the things you're, you're passionate about? What are the things you, what are your, you know, your favorite foods and and, you know, what would your friends, how would your friends describe you? Whatever. Like, tell me who you are. And then that takes about 10 minutes. They pass them in. And then he says, now I'm going to give you another survey on God. What is God like? Or what is Jesus like? Because I believe the class was actually on the gospel. What is Jesus like? And he says that, you know, 10 minutes. And, <laughs> you know, what is Jesus passionate about? What's he repulsed by? What, what makes him tick? He says, remarkably, McKnight says this, when he compared the two surveys, when they both came in, that 90% of the surveys about who Jesus or who God is and who they were were almost identical. That's theology students. It turns out that God's just like them. Here's how uh, you know that you've created God in your own image, Comer says. He agrees with you on everything. Now, this is why we're going to read him, and then we're going to jump into our passage. We can know that we've created God in our own image when he agrees with us on everything. 
He says, here's how you know. He agrees with you on everything. He hates all the people you hate. He voted for the person you voted for. If you're Republican, so is he. If he's Democrat, she is too. If you're passionate about blank, then God is passionate about blank, fill in the blank. If you're open and elastic about sexuality, so is he. And above all, he's tame. You never get mad at him or blown away by him or scared of him. Why? Because he's controllable. And of course, he's a figment of your imagination. A lot of us are bored in our Christian lives, bored with God, because we've made a very tame, very controllable, very manageable, very in our own image God. We're breaking the first couple of commandments. We're, we're to have no other gods before him. Whoops, we made him. And then we're not to make, you know, graven images. We may not walk around with a little, you know, cherubim doll or whatever, like a little idol that we made, but we have idols in our lives, right? And we can know by when it's threatened to be not in our lives, how anxious we become and or how angry we become, frustrated we become. A God who agrees with me on everything is the figment of my imagination. Well, in order to know who God really is, we have to go to the headwaters, to the source to the starting point. And that's where we are. If you're not already there, turn to Exodus 34. Again, I'm going to encourage you to memorize these verses from the NASB. I'll probably put it in an email so that we can all have it um, written the same way. But in Exodus, Exodus 34, 6 and 7, it's really 1 through 9, but we're not going to go through all the verses because we've got a lot of ground to cover uh, in just trying to get our our bearings here. To, we're we're going to be at the headwaters, but we're going to have to go uh, a little journey to get to the headwaters, and then why do the headwaters matter and all that. Today, we're calling this the profile of the God who goes with us. And so I want to give us um, why, why do I call the Lord the God who goes with us? But first of all, in 6 and 7, again, you see then the Lord passed by in front of Moses. He's on Mount Sinai. He told Moses to go there. He told him to bring some new tablets because you broke the old tablets, the old Ten Commandments, because you were infuriated at, at my people who were obstinate and way out of line and betraying me. So bring some new ones. I'm going to renew my covenant with my people. Uh, but verse 5, the Lord descended in a cloud and stood there with Moses as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him, and he proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. So this is, these are the headwaters. Headwaters are where the river gets its water from. It, you know, it comes from the source and it get, gets out into multiple rivers, etc. These are the headwaters. If we want to know who God really is, these are the headwaters. Why? Because God says, I'm going to show you my glory and I'm going to proclaim my name to you. We're going to talk about that in just a second, why that's so much. But then when he says, you want to know who I am? Here's who I am. Now, I'll probably forget later, so let me just point this out real quick. Notice where he doesn't start. God doesn't start, I am God. Where, and we usually start our, uh, I have probably a dozen books on the character and attributes of God or whatever on my shelves. I was asked this week, have I read the book, all the books on my shelves? Some of them, yes. Some of them, parts of it. But on, on like 12, 15 books, all of them usually start with God is sovereign, and they start with the omnis. He's omnipresent. That means he's everywhere. He's omniscient, which is a fancy word, means he's all-knowing. And he's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. Doesn't show up. We, our family would have lost on a family feud because we would have answered that, and it wouldn't have been up there. That's not where he begins. I want to point that out because I want to cause you to be curious and strain a little and go, what does he say? Who does he say he is? 
But before we dive deeper into those headwaters, we're going to get the broader context. We're going to get to eavesdrop, and this is the next slide, I think. We, we get to eavesdrop on Moses with God in chapter 33. And so you can take a left there and get to verse 11, but I'm going to give us a little context. So God had redeemed the Israelites out of Egypt. They were slaves there for a long time, 400 years. He's, he's redeemed them out of that slavery in Egypt. He's leading them through the wilderness to the promised land, the land that he promised long ago to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in chapter 32, Moses was up meeting with God, and he was gone a long time. And it's like, and, and it's funny, in the passage it says, I don't know where this Moses guy went, but Aaron, how about you make us a God? He says, all right, well, give me your wife's earrings, and let's melt them down, and and they make a golden calf. Almost all of us know this, or you've seen the really bad now, like Charlton Heston and the, you know, that, the exodus there. Um, and they, they make a golden calf. And Aaron says, this is your God, basically the one who brought you out of Egypt. It's interesting when the word of God that they got through Moses, God's mediator to them, when, when it was evaporating, the people begin to go, I gotta worship. I gotta have someone to put my security and trust and devotion to. So make us a God. We're told in Corinthians that all of these things were written for our instruction and encouragement, and kind of as reminder, not kind of, to nudge us and go, "Hey, don't think that you kind of got it figured out." We're they're written because we're just like them. And then he go and he refers to this section of scripture that the people. Um, basically uh, had a, a wild, raucous, immoral party and worshipped. They, they turned their back on God, abandoned him, and worshipped a golden calf that they just made. But we are just like that, Paul would say in Corinthians. And so <laughs> then Moses, because of that, Moses comes down, he breaks him. He goes back up to meet with God, and God's like, I'm done. I'm done. And look at uh, 33 uh, verse 3, he says, um, he says, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to start over with you, Moses. As Moses intercedes and says, no, no, no. God, do you realize that, what that would do to your name? Like he's, that's not in verse 3 yet. He's, he's saying, do you realize what that would do to your reputation among the nations, God? I mean, you redeemed us and then you destroy us. What does that do for you? God wants to start over with Moses. Moses is not selfish in this moment. He says, because he, he's frustrated with the people too. He says, no, 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 let's, let's, let's reconsider. And God says he will. He says, um, God, Moses talks him out of it. And in 33.3, it says, the Lord says, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst. Why? Because you're an obstinate people and I might destroy you on the way. So that's the context it's been a really hard time for Moses as a leader. It's been exasperating for him to return and find their idolatry and immorality. He's now, I mean, he's at a place of depletion, exhaustion. His mountaintop experience now, because he goes back to the mountain, is not one of, man, I'm on a retreat with God and I'm, I'm on a retreat high. He is exhausted, and God is saying, I'm not going to go with you. You guys go in. I promised it. You can go in. And, and Moses, no, no, no. Verse 11, we know that uh, he lets us know, thus the Lord used to speak with Moses face to face just as a man speaks to his friend. Okay, don't miss that. Moses, perhaps more than any other person who walked the planet, has this kind of intimate relationship with the Lord. He used to meet with him like a friend meets with him face to face. Now, God's not visible, but he would go to the tent of meeting and God's presence would be there. And the people would even watch when Moses would go meet with him. Well, he's meeting with God. Verse 13, skip down there. Moses says, now, therefore, I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, he's pleading with God, let me know your ways. Let me know how you operate. Let me know what your plans are, what your purposes are, the ways that you work that I may know you, so that I may find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. 
I, I want to pause. I, I want you to hear this because we'll end, we'll come back around to this. How can Moses say, I want to know your ways and I want to know you? He meets with him face to face. He, he, he saw God deliver his people out of Egypt. He saw God part the Red Sea and the Egyptians drown in it. He's seen God provide manna in the wilderness. He, he's seen God do miraculous thing after miraculous thing after miraculous thing. And we say, you, and you may be this way. You're like, well, I'll only believe in the God of the Bible if I see this, if he does this very specific thing, or he tells me this, or he shows me this. No, you won't. Moses is not in disbelief, though. But he's seen it all in terms of what we might think. Man, that's a lifetime of holy cow moments. Sorry, golden calf, not holy cow. Holy Lord moment. I didn't script that, I promise. Otherwise, it'd be really cheesy. Um, he's, he's saying, I want to know you more. I want to know you. And that, that's, that's shocking to me. How, you know him way better than we do. He says, I want to to know you, and I want to know that I've found favor or grace in your sight. And he keeps adding, remember, these are your people. So let's not destroy. These are your people. Verse 14, God says, all right, my presence shall go with you, and I'll give you rest, or in order to give you rest. His presence with us is what gives us rest. Then he said to him, if your presence does not go, this is Moses, if your presence does not go up with us, do not lead us up from here. I'm going to pause there. How often are we seeking God to get some situation ironed out, worked out, provided for, and then it's as if I got what I wanted? Moses, he's saying, I'll give you the land flowing with milk and honey. I'll give you all the blessings of that land. And for them, land was everything. It's, it's livelihood. It's produce. It's provide for your family. It's beauty. It's purpose. All of it. And Moses says, if you're not going, I don't want that. Can you say that? If, if I'm honest, sometimes I'm just after the bennies. But Moses, in this moment with God, God's saying, hey, you go. And he's, no, no, if your presence doesn't go, then I don't want to go. Verse 17, skip down. The Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing which you've spoken. He'll go, for you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name, meaning I really know you. Verse 18, then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. Again, he's already seen his glory. But Moses wants more. And I don't believe, because he's already seen the spectacular. We're, we're very much like, I want to see God show up, and I want it to be an only God could be the explanation for this. Those aren't bad. But we seem to want the fantastic and the spectacular. That's the God who I want. But when, notice, when God says, I'm going to make my glory pass before you, it's just him and Moses in a hidden place, and God shows him his backside. That's all that he can describe for us, because God, that's an anthropomorphism, meaning I'm giving him man-like qualities. He says, show me your glory. Hear the hunger in that. And do you realize, I don't care where you are right this moment with God. You may have detached and be running the other direction right now from him. But that hunger is still in you. Uh, you might be going after uh, something uh, with a couple of clicks and you're there, but you already know the diminishing returns because it's not actually satiating the hunger in you. You may go on a, a shopping spree and you're like, well, I got to have this. Well, if I have that, then I got to have this, right? Or it's hunting season. I mean, I got to load it up. None of this is wrong. But I am saying, we keep going after things and thinking, but once I have that, life will be where it's supposed to be. I'll be satisfied. You know, the only satisfaction, and that's what Moses is letting us know, that hunger, that appetite, this is what a relationship with God is like. He's glorious. He's loving. He's powerful. He cares. 
He's done many, many things in Moses' life, and yet he says, but I want to know you more. God put that in you and me. And so I, he says, uh, show me your glory. And God says, verse 19, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. Notice he calls his glory his goodness. In this context, they're one and the same. And God is good all the time. And so whatever it is that's radiant and, and full of splendor about him, whatever is glorious will always be fully good. I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will, this is odd, I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I'll be gracious to him, I'll be gracious. I'll show compassion to him, I'll show compassion. And by that, that's less about, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm shunning these people. This is actually more about, I'm actually right now in this moment going to choose to be gracious to these stiff-necked, obstinate people who served a golden calf. I'm going to choose to be gracious and compassionate to them. And then he says, so Moses, I am going to show you my goodness, but, verse 20, but you can't, you can't see all of me. He says, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. He says, but I'll, I'll, I'm going to have you go to a place. You're going to stand there in a rock. I'm going to come by. My glory is passing by. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll cover you with my hand as I pass by. Then I'll take my hand away, and you shall see my back. But my face shall not be seen. And then he's going to give them some instruction um, in the beginning of 34. Hey, meet me tomorrow. Bring some tablets. Cut some stone tablets. I'll re- New, I'll renew my covenant with my people. So meet me here tomorrow, and I will show you my glory. I will proclaim my name. So I want to ask this question. What is God's name? What is God's name? Because for us, that's like, that's so odd. Okay, you're going to show me your glory, but I'm going to proclaim my name. Didn't you already tell me what your name? I mean, you're God. Well, God is really more of a, a title, if you will. And God is going to proclaim his name, that he actually has a name. Now, go back to Exodus 3. Exodus 3, um, like Exodus 3 and 4 is all about God letting Moses know. You got the burning bush. He gets, when, once he knew no, uh, Moses took notice, he says, okay, now I've seen what my people are going through in, in Egypt. I've heard their cries, and I'm going to send you as my deliverer to deliver them out of that bondage and slavery in Egypt. And this is where Moses is like, I don't know. I can't talk real great, and can you send somebody else with me? He tries to get out of it. Eventually, God gets kind of miffed at it. And he's like, look, I'll send Aaron. You know, that's the story. But at the beginning, I want you to see Moses, um, Moses said to God in verse 13, Behold, I'm going to go to the sons of Israel. Like you say, I'll say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, a couple of names of God, we won't camp long. If you go back to Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word there for God, some of you know this, is Elohim. Actually, El is more of the singular. Elohim is kind of a plural, um, but interestingly, plural, and yet the verbs there seem to indicate singular. We think Trinity, three in one. But El or Elohim is God, God the creator God, and other, um, you know, other ites around them, Amorites, Hizites, all those ites, um, Canaanites, they would, they would also use the word El, just about God the creator. And he was kind of the ruler in their minds. He's kind of the ruler of all the other gods. And what, I want you to hear that because then when we get to our passage, the Lord, the Lord God, the word there is El, God is El. But the word, um, the Lord, the Lord is Yahweh. You heard that word? Everybody say Yahweh. Probably heard it because sometimes there's some worship songs with Yahweh in it. But in Exodus 3, interestingly, don't worry, we're not going to stay in Nerdville very long. In Exodus 3, this is very important. 
In Exodus 3, when he says, I am who I am, he's using the same root form that Yahweh comes from. It's basically the being verb. I am who I am. Or it could also be translated, I am who I will be or who I will always be. I am who I will be. You want to know who I am? I am always consistent, always stable, always reliable, always trustworthy, always will be who I always am. That's the first person, I am. Yahweh, the same root, is the third person. We sang it, he is. So when God says, I'm going to make my name, I'm going to proclaim my name to you, he had already told Moses' his name, I am who I will be, or I am who I am. Tell them that. But he can say that, but when we speak of him, or when they speak of him, it's he is. And he is God. He is Lord God. He is the one who is the ruler of all. He is the one and only creator. He is Yahweh. He is and so, in our culture, a person's name, you know, doesn't have a whole lot of significance. Their culture, a person's name had much more significance than our names do. Um, where For us, it's like just a label or something that had a nice ring or was your best friend in college. That's, that's, that has meaning, sorry. Uh, or, or it's, you know, it had a nice ring as, as you as young parents, like, Googled the, the top 50 baby names in 2023. Uh, we almost treat it like that. But for them, name, and I want you to hear this, name means identity. Name means character. Name means reputation. Now, we use it that way. You know, you're looking for a plumber. You want somebody who has a good what? Name. They have a good reputation for doing quality work and not overcharging you. And by the way, um, they show up when they say and they leave when they say and all that. They have a good name. That name takes time to build, and they're trying to protect that name, right? For them particularly, it was about who you really are. It would go with a person's even God-given purpose at times. You think of um, the name, identity, reputation. You think of Jacob. Jacob means deceiver or one who usurps. Um, Jacob deceived Esau. Jacob you know, deceived Isaac. And then later Jacob gets deceived. Like, it's rampant. But yet when he wrestles with God, God changes his name. He has to first say what his name is. He has to first say, I'm a deceiver. And then he touches his hip, right? He's going to walk with a limp. And then his name is changed to Israel, which either means the L at the end, God, God fights, or one who wrestles with God. Whether it's about God's character, yes, and whether it's about even just the story of Jacob, you were willing to try to wrestle with me, and I'm going to do something and continue my promise to bless your family, to bless the nations uh, of the world. And so a name means a lot for them. And so he says, I am who I am. Turn back to Exodus 34. Who does God, when he says, I'm going to proclaim my name, he passes by, um, he's with him in the cloud. That's got to be mind-boggling and category-shattering and unnerving because for them, the cloud was God's presence is manifest. There's probably a heaviness. And think about this. He's experiencing God's glory viscerally right now. And glory uh, at least has these ideas with it. It has the idea of heaviness or weight, like when you want your life to count, or matter. You want your life to have some weight. That's what glory is. It's weight. Uh, glory is also light. It's resplendent and awe-inspiring, um, and it's also beauty. The perfections of God's character. I am who I always will be. He is who he always will be. So that's beautiful, right? When there's, when there's symmetry, when there's consistency, when there's never a flaw, when there's never a dip, when there's never a betrayal, when you're always who you always are, there's beauty in that. And Moses is experiencing viscerally. He's being in God's presence. He's being undone. And then God says uh, he's going to proclaim his name. 
the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh, El, compassionate and gracious. Compassionate and gracious, it's interesting here. Um, when we think about God, do we think about he's a he, is he a she, is he a, right? It's interesting that these qualities, compassionate, um, some would say that at least has connections to a root word coming from a mother's womb. And so in, when it says that God is compassionate, that think of a mother's feelings of affection, delight, nurture, ability to enter into your world, your hurts, your disappointments, and to suffer with you. Literally for us, the word compassion means to suffer with. I'm a God who suffers with. But also I'm a God of great graciousness, which means unmerited favor, yes. But it's also a father-like active support, supply, and tangible help in time of need. So is God like your mom? Yes. Is God like your father? Yes. He suffers with, he supplies, and it's not because you and I earned it, but because just his bent is generosity. He overflows with care. He overflows with provision. He's looking out like a shepherd to protect. He's pulling you close, or when you draw near to him, he draws near to you. And therefore, his nearness is our good, not something we have to be haunted by. But he's also slow to anger. Um, Yahweh has a long fuse. Unlike many of us, or I'll just say me, I can get triggered. Um, impatience shows up every year on my area to grow in. It's gotten, you know, I've grown, so it's, my anger has lengthened or whatever. But slow to anger, it means he has a long fuse. It doesn't mean he never gets angry. He's just slow to it. Mercy is his priority. Mercy is his constant pace. The word, one of the words here for uh, anger is a word for nose or nostrils. It takes a long time for you to see God's nostrils flare when it's like, all right, I've had enough. You've seen that before in your parents? Or have your nose, nostrils fl flared <laughs> when something happened at work and you're like, that's it, that's the last. They just, right? It's interesting. His, his nostrils take a long, long, I know he doesn't have nostrils, but they take a long, long time to get flaring or fuming. Interestingly, that he, God has to be, in the scriptures, he has to be provoked to anger. He does not have to be provoked to be merciful. In Isaiah, uh, maybe I'll try to remember, I think it's 28, 16, but don't, you can write it down and check me. I, this is not firm. But he talks about that God will do a, a strange work, and he's referring to a time when God's going to have to do some disciplinary action. He calls that the strange work. Why? Because he's slow to anger. He's much more about mercy, compassion. He's also abounding in loving kindness and truth or faithfulness. For truth is faithfulness or trustworthiness. Loving kindness is the Hebrew word chesed. Everybody say chesed. I said that one time before, while we were engaged, I think, not yet married, and um, something came out into my tea glass at Dave's parents' house. It was great. Chesed. But that's how you got to say it, chesed. Loving kindness, steadfast love, loyal love. That's what that means. It's God's covenant-keeping, loyal love. And truth is that he's always true to his word. He always speaks truth, and he will not deceive or deal falsely. You don't have to worry about that. He will not forget nor forsake those he's made his own possession. Verse 7, who keeps that loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yahweh forgives iniquity, which could be a more general term for wickedness or evil. He forgives transgression. Think crossing a line. He forgives transgression, which is a rebellious crossing of the line or breaking God's standard. Where you also know that you're doing it. He forgives that. And he forgives sin, which is, uh, we know, you know, missed the mark. We don't quite get there often. We're just not even fully aware that something is outside of God's standards or is wrong. God knows, and he forgives. You think of 1 John, if we confess our sins, the ones we know about, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, which includes the ones we didn't confess, but we, don't, we might not even be aware. And so the Lord forgives. Why? Because of his character, not your deserving, not my deserving, his forgiveness. Not because you suddenly get your act together today, but because he's always compassionate and gracious. He is who he always will be.
Dane Ortland uh, in the, uh, says, this is the heart of God. I love this phrase. He says this idea that God is compassionate and gracious and abounding in loving kindness. He keeps loving kindness, forgives. He says, this is the spring-loaded tilt of God's affections. That it's his natural bent and the regular flow of who he is and what he does. He says, God is infinitely compassionate, infinitely ready to forgive you and me, so that it ought to be ascribed exclusively to our unbelief if we do not obtain pardon from him. Do you hear that? This is who he is. And he says he's eager because of his heart of compassion. He's not like you and me. Even our most intense human love, as I was talking about mom's love or father's love, those are the faintest echoes of heaven's cascading abundance, Ortland says. He intends to restore you into the radiant resplendence for which you were created. So the Lord, he's compassionate, and he's gracious, loyal love. But verse 7, oh, this kind of ruins it. Can't put this on a coffee mug as well. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Let me just speak to this very quickly. We'll probably come back to it. This has a lot of complexity. At face value, you might read this and think, you might be tempted to think, well, what this is saying is if mom left dad for another man, then her daughters and sons are predetermined to be unable to be faithful to their spouses. Or if grandpa and dad were alcoholics, then little Johnny is doomed to a life of addiction. My friend Cole Huffman is very helpful in this. He says, this generational sin idea has layers of complexity. For sure, our sin as parents, it, it, there's a wake. There are consequences that affect our family, affect our children. But he, I, I like what he says that, yes, sin can run in families where the sin is modeled or tolerated or celebrated. The child can pick up those sin patterns or even be predisposed, not predetermined, but predisposed. Yet even if granddad and dad sin the same way, when I sin, it's still my own sin. What the Lord is really saying here is essentially no generation is sinless and that God overlooks no one and no sin that mars his creation. In other words, he has to deal with it and he will deal, he will deal with it with each generation. But I want you to notice the contrast. We're going to move on. He keeps loving kindness for thousands and he visits, visits the iniquity to the third and fourth generation. That contrast is on purpose. To say, you want to know what God is like? He is gushing with loyal love, with grace, with mercy, with forgiveness. Yet, he also can't go, eh, don't worry about it. We're going to come back to that at the end. But this is Yahweh's conundrum. Because how can you be compassionate and gracious and forgiving, but also you punish sin? How in the world is that going to happen? Well, from... From God's um, declaration, revelation of himself, this is who I am. Moses, what's his response? He bows down. He worships. And then he says, if I found favor in your sight, he's still saying that. I pray, let the Lord go along in our midst. Even though the people are so obstinate, I get it, God. I'm tired of them too. Pardon our iniquity and our sin. And God's response, which is not in our passage, it's the next one. He says, I'll do it. I'll go with you. Bring the tablets. I'm going to have Moses write it, but I'm going to tell you what's going to go on it. I'm renewing my covenant with you out of my loyal love, my heart of compassion and grace. And because of what I know I've promised for you and what, what I know the blessing I will bring through you, though you will fail me again and again, and I'll deal with your failures and I'll lovingly do so, but I'm going to bring about the one who, if you see him, you've seen me. We're going to go quickly from the back of God to Jesus' face. Because now in Jesus, we behold God's glory with skin on it. Each week in this series, we're going to go through some different stories of God's people as he goes with them. And sometimes they're going to be in rebellion. Sometimes they're even going to use God's character as to why they didn't do something he told them to do. Jonah says, I didn't want to go to the Ninevites because I know you're compassionate and gracious. Oof, we're going to look at that. That'll be fun. But Jesus, even as God reveals himself here, we see his back, if you will. There's a little bit of hiddenness. But in Jesus, we see 
God's attributes clearly and perfectly embodied. The author of the Hebrews calls Jesus the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. He embodies Yahweh's character. John's, John's gospel, John 1, 14, the word, speaking of Jesus, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. There's so much language in John 1, 14 to 18 that refers back to this, a tabernacle, a tent, um, that he dwells or tabernacles among them, glory, grace and truth, all of it. Listen, the word became flesh, dwelt among us. We saw his glory, glories of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then verse 18, no one's seen God at any time. But he who is the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he's explained him. Elsewhere in John's gospel, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then interestingly, John 17, when he prays, he tells God, I've manifested what? I've manifested your name to the men you gave me. I manifested your name. What is he saying? I've shown them your character. I have embodied compassion, grace, loving kindness, faithfulness, trustworthiness, forgiveness. And because of that, I've made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love which you've loved me with will be in them and I in them. Jesus is also the solution to Yahweh's conundrum. Paul tells us in Romans 3, how do you be gracious, compassionate, but also deal with sin? Paul tells us in Romans 3 that he put Jesus on the cross to publicly display his righteousness and his grace. And he says he did this so that he might be just dealing with sin, he has to, and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus and the one who has faith in the one who is Yahweh in the flesh. And that's his invitation to every single one of us. We need to be justified. We can't justify ourselves. He says, I've sent my son. And he died so that my, your sin would be put on him. He'd be, take your place. But also that all of my splendor would be on display. All at one time, all in one person, the person of Jesus who took your place. And you can't do enough to get right with him. I can't do enough. All we can do is trust him with our lives and say, Lord, what you did on the cross was for me. And I needed you to die. Your death should have been my death. And now I trust you that I can have your life and forgiveness because of who you are and your grace and mercy, not because of me. I want to follow you my whole life. If you've not done that, that's his invitation to you and to me. And lastly, I want to say this with Moses. Um, which, you know, Moses met with God like no one else did. Yet Moses wanted to know him more. And I think about these qualities. I want you to think about these qualities. Do you have, which one of them do you have the most trouble believing that about God? Where it gives you reverence in him or confidence that the same God, Yahweh, goes with you into this week. Because many of us are living anxious because we're not focusing on who God is. We're not believing who God is. We're not taking him at his word. This is who he is and that he's with you. He's the God who went with them and he's the God who goes with you and me. And as his ambassadors, we're to reflect these parts of his character. We're to be hints of who he really is. And the question is, are you and am I? And so Moses, though he met with God often, saw his glory, he says, show me your glory. I want to encourage you. Make that a prayer of yours. God, I want, in this next month, I want to know you more. Show me your glory. Show me your compassion. Show me that you're slow to anger. Help me to believe that because I think of you like that you're disappointed with me and your arms are folded and all you, have to, all you do is just put up with me. Remember this the spring-loaded tilt of his affections is toward you. He's for you, and he's with you and me. I want to invite the worship team up. We're going to sing of his goodness. But I think of this, Jeremiah 9. There are echoes of this passage in it. But he says, hey, don't let, if you're wise, don't boast in your wisdom. If you're rich, don't boast in that. If you've got a reputation out there with, you know, 
don't let that be the thing that you're just really after in life and think that's where really life is. He says, but let him who boasts, so we are allowed to boast, let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, or I am Yahweh, who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Let your satisfaction, your delight, the boast of your life be that you understand and know him. If we're going to know him, it can't be of our own imagination. It can't be a figment of our imagination. But the one who put on pigment is the one who shows us most clearly. You've seen him. You've seen the Father. Lord, uh, as we sing of your goodness, send us out. Gird it up. Send us out encouraged. Send us out reassured. Send us out with a greater hunger to know you more. And I pray that as that it becomes our pursuit, Lord, we'd say like David, there's, there's just one thing I ask, and I seek after it's to, to gaze upon your beauty and to dwell with you and to inquire of you, to, to do life with you. Thank you, Lord, that you do life with us, you go with us. And may hints of your character leak out of our lives so that others would be pointed to the one who is Yahweh, who is, and who always will be. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to sing goodness of God. And we'll have a benediction. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in
benediction from the prophet Hosea. So let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going forth is as certain as the dawn. And he will come to us like the rain, like the spring.